How many of you, this is your first Fusion Conference that you've ever been to? Awesome, very cool. Well, I am so excited to be able to be here with you. What an incredible group we have. You guys just look amazing. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk with you a little bit just about early childhood. And I love getting to hang out with people who get to do the same thing that I get to do. It's so fun to be able to work with early childhood kids because we all know, because we do it each week, it's not just babysitting. We have such an incredible opportunity to teach young kids about God. And so we have the privilege of sometimes introducing those first concepts to kids, teaching them about how important they are to him and how much he loves them and laying some foundational truths in their life that are gonna impact them for the rest of their life. So we, um, we, we're just honored to be able to get to do what we do. So before we go further, let's just pray real quick and ask God to bless our moments here together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to hang out here together. I thank you for each one of these uh, people in this room today, Lord, that are willing to give of their time to love on kids that you put around them. Lord, I just pray a blessing upon each one of them today. Lord, if they are weary, I pray that you would take that weariness and you would replace it with your strength. Lord, if they are feeling discouraged or out of ideas, Lord, I pray that you would give them fresh vision, that they would leave this conference this weekend with such um, a rekindled excitement in their heart for what it is that you've called them to do. Lord, I pray that you would fill every single volunteer spot. Lord, we know that is something that is not always easy to do in the nursery area. God, we just pray that you would bring volunteers to them. People would just start coming to them saying, I want to get involved and I want to make a difference. We just pray that you would bless them in that capacity. Lord, be with us today just in the few minutes we have Lord, that we can encourage each other and inspire each other, that we can continue to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, let me just tell you a little bit about me. I am, uh, my grandfather was an Assembly of God pastor, my dad was an Assembly of God pastor, so I was pretty much born in church, um, grew up all my life in all different sized churches from little small churches. Um, we're now at a larger church, so I've had experience in all different sized churches and actually never thought, never planned on being in ministry. Kind of one of those things, but God always has plans that maybe they're different than ours. So ended up marrying my husband um, who felt called in the ministry. And so we actually were youth pastors here in the Northwest District for about 10 years. And then now we are in Springfield, Missouri at a church there, James River Church. And we, I've been on staff there for 10 years now in the early childhood department. And we are one church. We operate with three different campuses. And on a Sunday, we would have um, 800 to 1,000 kids that fit in that six week to pre-K age group. So it's busy, it's fun. Um, and we're continually learning and growing and having to tweak what we do um, just to continually try to make things smoother. But we're so thankful for the, the young families that are coming to the church and the kids that we get to impact because we know that it truly is making a difference. Um, in our early childhood ministry, we really focus on the basics because at this age, that's, what's, that's really what's important to them. Um, we're not going to be implementing the most current technology or the latest trend because they, they really aren't even noticing those kinds of things. They need something that's simple, something that's fun, something that's repetitive. They want to feel safe and loved. And just some of those basic things um, that if you think through some of those simple basic things and just be strategic in your implementation of them, you can create a fantastic early childhood ministry that's really making a difference. What age group are you talking about? Six weeks to pre-K. So there's, we, take, we start taking babies once they're six weeks old, um, and then they go up till five, some six-year-olds, six but they haven't started kindergarten. We teach that age bracket. Oh. We have a very small church. We don't break them on cars. So okay, yeah. Awesome so they're all in one group. That's a challenge in itself, but every challenge is an opportunity to be creative and learn something new, right? Um, so we um, really just focus on the basics. So I probably won't say anything that's this mind-blowing thing that you've never thought of or maybe that you're not even doing, but hopefully I can at least encourage you today because I know sometimes week after week, 
um, it can get wearisome. You're looking for volunteers. You're, you know, taking care of those kids that sometimes they're not easy. And, and, and it can become wearisome. But I want to encourage you today that what you're doing really makes a difference and it really is important. Um, the fact that you're at this conference, taking a weekend away of your time to grow in your leadership shows how much you love the kids that you're working with and what an important focus that is in your life. So I commend you for doing that and um, hope that you walk away feeling super equipped just with everything that's happening throughout the weekend. Well, um, like I said, we do have a privilege of working with kids and we are planting those seeds. We all know um, if you've ever done any kind of gardening or anything, you plant those seeds and you water them and it takes time. Unfortunately, we don't get to see like, oh, that day, it's happening. Sometimes it's years and sometimes we never get to see that happen in the time span that we have with them. But what we're doing and those seeds that we're planting are gonna make a difference um, as they grow up. So remember that what we're doing in the now is going to make a difference in there later. So you are making a difference even if you can't see it. So we're going to kind of talk about the why it's important to teach young kids about God and the how we can teach young kids about God. So we could start with scientific reasons of why it's important to teach kids about God. Now, I am not a scientist, um, but I'm a mom, and so I do have two kids and got to see them grow up my youngest or our oldest is a freshman in college and our daughter is a sophomore in high school so most all of you probably know scientifically that when a baby's born their brain is not fully developed it's actually about a quarter of the size capacity that an adult brain is so those first few years of life those first five years of life their brain is growing very rapidly and um, research actually says that um, about age three, their brain is growing and they're learning at the fastest rate that they will of their entire life. Well, three-year-old, that's right in our target age group that we're working with. So scientifically, we have a great reason for teaching kids about God because it's the perfect time for their brain to start learning and understanding those things. Foundationally, it's important to teach young kids about God. Those first few, first few years of a child's life are laying the foundation for their future health, happiness, success. Um, Proverbs 22.6, I'm sure you all know that verse, says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a foundation that is being laid in the lives of kids. So research has shown that positive early experiences have a huge effect on what kind of an adult a child's going to become, and the experiences set a foundation for success and happiness in their life. Now, I thought this was interesting that even non-religious studies have shown that the foundation for lifelong values and morals are formed in those earliest years of life. R.S. Lee, the author of Your Growing Child in Religion, says, the first seven years of life constitute the period for laying the foundations of religion. This is the most important period in the whole of a person's life in determining his later religious attitudes. Now we want to do more than lay a religious foundation. We want to lead kids into a personal relationship with Jesus. And the fact that we get to introduce them, some of them are coming from homes where they are not hearing it at home, and we're the ones that are getting to introduce them to Jesus for the first time. Like, how exciting is that? Um, the greatest evangelical window is with young kids. I don't know if any of you have heard of the 414 window, but people are 85% more likely to make a decision for Christ between the ages of 4 and 14. So. Again, the foundation that we're laying and the opportunity that we have with those young kids is so important. And sometimes we get caught up in the diapers and the, you know, the basics that take a lot of time. And we are caring for kids and we want to keep them safe and play with them and have fun. But we also want to do all of that while we're teaching them about God's love and those spiritual truths that are going to make a difference in their life. Spiritually, it's important to teach young kids about God, because when you reach a young child, you're reaching an entire family. It is, you never know what God's gonna do. 
we have, um, at each of our three campuses, we have a weekday preschool program that we also run during the week. And about a year ago, we actually opened a preschool. It's a free preschool for um, families that live in the poverty, um, they fall in the poverty line. So we, our pastor met with our public school superintendent and just said, what, what could we as a church do to come alongside and help you? And he was just talking about kids that are coming from, a lot of times their home situation is not stable. Uh, they're moving around a lot. They're missing a lot of school just because of things going on at home. And kids, even in elementary school, were dropping out and not being successful in school. So they don't, most of them have the financial ability to be able to put their kids in a preschool program. So he's like, if there's something you could do to start laying a foundation in these kids' lives, it would make a huge difference. So as a church, we launched a program that they can apply for it, and if they meet that um, poverty, that federal poverty line, they can be accepted when their kids are age three or four in this program. So we, we tell them right up front, we're a church. Um, we're going to give your kid a great education, but it's all going to be mixed with God and his love for them. We're not going to hide that. And so most of the families in the program have no church background. They haven't grown up with it. It's all new to them. And so we uh, started with some basics of teaching the kids the alphabet with scripture. So we started with A, all things are possible for those who believe, Mark 9, 23. So we had a little three-year-old girl and her family life was not a good situation. Mom and dad were not married. There was drugs in the home, violence in the home. Um, they just never knew really what was happening. And so one night, um, the mom had kicked the dad out. She had locked the apartment door and he was banging on the door, threatening violence to the family. Mom was scared and so she had all of her kids in the bedroom with her trying to keep them safe. And little three-year-old Amaya started saying, all things are possible for those who believe. Mark 9:23. Over and over she would say it. The mom started getting mad because she, she didn't want to hear that. Things weren't going good for her. She didn't believe that she had any hope. And so as that little girl kept saying that, the mom was getting more mad and said, you stop saying that, that is not true. And she said, yes it is. I learned that at school, it's in the Bible. All things are possible for those who believe. Well, somebody had given Mary a Bible previously. She'd never opened it, never looked at it, but she had it. And so she was so frustrated with her daughter. She said, I'm going to go get that and show you that it's, that is not true, so you will stop saying that. So she got a Bible and managed to find Mark 9.23. And as she read it, she just started crying. She could not believe that there was something that could give her hope like that. So she brought her family to church the next Sunday, um, came to our church, and Mary got saved. We're about a year now into the journey, and they're still, they still have a long ways to go. They're trying to get clean. Um, they're going through counseling, doing all these things, but we've seen her teenage kids come to know the Lord, and all of this from a three-year-old who didn't understand actually the concept that she was saying, but she had learned a foundational spiritual truth that impacted her family and changed their future. So you never know. The, the, the three-year-old that you're teaching may not totally grasp what it is, but those seeds that you're planting, those things that they're picking up, are going to make a difference in this world and in their family. So spiritually, it is so important because when we reach kids, we are reaching families. So let's look at the how do we do it. It's, it's um, not always easy because it seems that the diapers I priority, there's so many things. We do want to create that safe environment. And so we use those basics to incorporate how we are teaching young kids about God, because we're going to do that through everything that we do. So the first thing we do is we create a safe and loving environment. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? That's nothing mind blowing, but that's the way kids learn the best. When they feel safe, and they feel loved, they are gonna learn better than any other time. So there is um, another bonus that when you create that safe and loving environment is parents are gonna feel good about leaving their child with you. If they're sitting in service and they're worried the whole time, is my kid okay? Are, are they gonna take good care of them? Are they safe? They're not gonna fully be able to focus on what's happening in the service. 
So they're missing out. So if you create that safe and loving environment, it's a win for the kid and it's a double win for the parents because now they can focus on what's happening and God can move in their life in the service. So that's just a little extra bonus you get. Um, so there's some simple things you can do to create that safe and loving environment. The first thing I would say is welcome kids by name with a smile on your face when they come. We all know that there is that kid that you're like, oh, here comes Johnny. <laughs> Johnny's going to cry the whole time. Johnny bites everybody. There's some kind of challenge. I mean, we deal with biting in the kids, with the kids we work with. Not everybody else has to deal with that in youth or wherever else, hopefully. Um, so we're dealing with some unique situations in early childhood, and there can be those kids that are a little more uh, difficult than others. But put a smile on your face and be excited to see that child. Um, I don't know how your check-in system works, but you probably have some kind of name tag or something. What a perfect cheat for you. If you don't remember that child's name, it should be right there on their name tag. So you can greet them by name. That makes a difference for the kids, even the youngest, who don't understand what you're saying. It's still important because they are known. And to the parent, my child is known. I know as a mom, when, you, when somebody knows my kids and they get down and they talk to my kids and they are happy to see my kids, as a mom, that makes you feel so good. So you're really speaking to the parents as well when you're greeting their child by name. You're really making that loving and safe environment. Um, make it fun. Greet kids with a high five or a hug. It is unfortunate in this, the society that we live in. There's so many accusations and things. And so to the church, we have to be careful. And so I think we've kind of started to move so far away from any kind of physical touch out of fear of an accusation. But God created kids to need physical touch. They need to know that you care about them. So we are very strategic in making sure that every kid has a physical touch when they come. Um, we have lots of safeguards in place. You need to use wisdom in how you do that. And I would be very clear with your volunteers on how you want that done. So we're, we let them know. We want a high five, fist bump, a hug, whatever to happen as that parent's dropping off. So the parent's right there, the parent seeing it happen, and that kid is getting a physical um, interaction with you. Then we do um, like a it's just a simple good morning song where the kids are learning to um, have physical touch, good, good positive physical touch with each other. It's not hitting, biting, hurting each other. We're, we're happy to see each other. We love each other. So we just have a simple song. It's kind of a, just a little good morning. We're so happy that you're here. You could do it just where the kids know it and you're singing it. You could sing along with a CD, however you choose to implement it. But we take that time. It's just like a minute long. And the kids now know, because we do it every week, that during this time, we're all gonna hug each other, high five each other, and it, it really is so cute. When we first implemented it, they all just kind of stood there and looked. And then, I mean, kids, they copy what they see. So as soon as they saw what's happening, they all wanted to do it. And so these little, little, little ones are just hugging each other and falling over because, you know, they're a little tipsy anyway. It's so cute. And so we're creating that family environment where kids feel safe and feel loved simply in just how we welcome them and how we're interacting with them. So you can be strategic in something as little as that. Um, then you can say goodbye to the kids as they leave. And I can't wait to see you next week. So one, you've made the kids feel like they're an important part of what happened. Two, you've created excitement for that return visit. And that's what you want to happen. You want those kids having so much fun that they're asking mom and dad next week, I wanna come back, I wanna be a part. The teacher said they're waiting for me, I've got to get back there. And get those families in the habit of coming each week. So something as simple as saying, Johnny, I'm so glad you were here today. I can't wait to see you next week. Makes a big difference to the kids and the families creating that safe and loving environment. Um, and then you've sent the, the parents off one last time at the end, reminding them that their child is loved. And that, that's a big difference. So how we teach young kids about lo God's love is through us creating a safe and loving environment. And then we do it through repetition. At this age, repetition is key. You cannot say the same thing too many times. 
I mean, if you have kids, you probably know they could watch the same video over and over and over and over. They just, repetition is how they learn. So we want to use that in the spiritual truth or the concept that we're working with or teaching that day. Be intentional in how you are repeating that throughout the day. So um, the way we do it is everything that we do. If our songs are gonna be around that concept that we're teaching, our craft, everything is going to all be speaking to that same concept that we're trying to teach them and just create that repetition over and over and over because hopefully they can walk away with a little piece of it. They may not understand it, but they're getting a little piece of it. So create a safe and loving environment, teach through repetition, and then create an environment for kids to learn by watching, listening, and doing. Kids need to do all three of those to really pick up and connect with what you're doing. So you want to get, um, get kids involved in what you're doing. Make it interactive and fun. Have a time of singing that has motions and dancing and get the kids out where they're being involved in it. Um, when we teach our Bible verses, we always have motions that go with our Bible verses because we want the kids doing and that helps them with their remembering. So that is another way um, to reinforce what you're trying to teach them by what you're asking them to do. So be strategic in that as well. Okay, so those are the basics. And so I'm gonna just kind of tell you a little bit about how we do it at our church. And um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of great ways at the end. Um, I think we'll have time to do a little Q&A if you have questions. And then if you have a great idea, I would love to learn from you as well. So kind of how we implement this is we lay out our year, our whole year of the concepts that we want to teach. So each month um, is like November is thankfulness, obviously. So each week is going to be a simple concept. We narrow it down to just a two or three word sentence that is going to, everything is going to boil down to that because hopefully they can remember that one little thing. So maybe week one is thank you God for my family. Week two is thank you God for my friends. Simple things like that. So we lay out our year of what each one of those um, concepts are that we want to teach kids. And then we write a curriculum around that that, that will um, reinforce that with the kids. Um, we call, all of our classroom names are zoo animals. So we kind of have like a little zoo area back in our early childhood area. So when kids go to our kids' church um, for the preschoolers, it's called Zooper Church. And so the one little sentence that we narrow it down to, that we want them to learn is called our Zoo Clue. And so it could be something as simple as something like this. This is a Zoo Clue, God is powerful. So this, everything we do that week is going to be centered around teaching kids that God is powerful. So our songs, everything is gonna be um, centered around this. And then love is in the details. So we try to make it fun. Um, we will ring a bell and have a fun time for the zoo clue to happen. So the kids kind of, it's kind of like Pavlov's dog, how they're trained to, to respond. And so we, the teacher will jingle a little bell and they're like, ah, and we have a mailbox in our classroom that this simple zoo clue is in. And so sometime throughout the day after they've had their Bible story and all those different things, we're gonna ring that bell and they're gonna run over and be so excited to see what the zoo clue is in the mailbox. Um, it's gonna be on their coloring sheet whatever their, do, uh, their craft, whatever is gonna have to do with this. And then we also print one of these and hang it on our classroom door so the parents can see it. We have 52 classrooms in our, our one campus for early childhood. So that's a lot of doors that has this hanging on it and that could seem like totally unnecessary. It probably is unnecessary, but God can use the little details to touch somebody. So actually we had a mom that emailed us and told us, what a difference this zoo clue made to her. So we had these hanging on the door and we have music that's, that's playing in the halls and the, the songs we pick all would also have to do with the lessons that we're teaching. So the music was playing in the hall. Mom had just been to, uh, going through a divorce. She had just lost her job and she was walking through the hall and the song that happened to be playing was, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing that my God can't do. And as she was passing room after room after room, she was seeing God is powerful on the door. And she said, 
it was such a reminder that God saw me, right, in the circumstances that I'm in that are totally not good and out of my control, but God is powerful and he can do something. So you never know what a difference those little details can make. So as you're reinforcing those truths, and that's what I love about the little simple truths that we teach kids, it's, it's great for adults to latch on to. And we, do, we allow people to volunteer in early childhood that may not even be saved yet. They may be beginning their journey. They just are new to the church and are learning. They still have to go through the background screening process and all those things because we want, obviously, to have a safe place. But it's so fun being in Zuper Church and you're teaching this simple story, simple concept to kids, and you're seeing adults who have no church background all of a sudden be like, wow, it's speaking to the adults too. Um, so once we lay out our year with our concepts, our zoo clues that we're going to teach for the whole year, we write our curriculum and then we start implementing it. And it's going to look a little bit different in each age group. So I'm going to kind of just tell you how it looks for the different age groups. We have um, everything's ready for our volunteers. We all know that in early childhood, we're always looking for volunteers, right? It does not matter how big or small your church is. We're just, that's just always a need that we have. And so we want to make it as easy as possible for, for our volunteers to come in. So we have everything ready for them. They don't have to prep anything. Um, but we do have a schedule that we want them to implement. And it's very the very detailed schedule. So we lay out specifically um, throughout the day, each basically each minute um, of what's going to be happening throughout the day. And that way we are sure that what we're trying to teach is being done in all of our classrooms. And for some volunteers, that's really comforting. They don't have to come in and like, what am I going to do with these kids for an hour? It's just all right there. And we keep things moving really quickly. So with our babies, our zero through six monthers, we know that babies are going to learn best by watching people's faces, listening to voices, being rocked all those things. So really that's how we're going to be teaching God's love is through those things. So that's the primary thing that we are going to have our volunteers doing. But we do ask them while you're doing that, pray over those babies. Let them hear you pray over them. Some kids may not have anybody that's praying over them and prayer makes a difference. Then we've implemented baby praise. I don't know if you've seen the baby praise DVDs. They're like baby Einstein and it's just the fun little graphics. When we started implementing that in the, the classroom, it was amazing the difference it makes. We just play that video in the background. And Psalms 8, 2 says, Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. It's so powerful when kids start praising. And so introducing that concept of praise and cre excuse me, creating that atmosphere of praise, even with our youngest, is going to make a difference. So we have that baby praise happening. And then we actually um, made our own book. Just take some simple truths. You know, if you've ever looked at a baby board book, it's going to be like one or two words on it with a picture. They, they don't understand what you're saying, but you're still introducing it to them. So we just made our own book that's like, God loves me. I love my church. Some simple sentences with some graphics, and we do have the teachers read that even in our um, infant through six months. So there'll be a time that they read that book. So that would uh, be primarily what happens um, in our youngest. When, once they hit six months to one year, we're going to add our wiggle giggle component, and that is going to be little worship with little um, actions, and they can kind of start moving around at that time. You're starting to make it fun, interactive. They're still going to have that baby praise time. As they get older, we just play that like during diapering time or something, um, where that's still happening in the classroom. But now they get to have wiggle giggle time. So we have, you can get little um, like egg shakers, like little tiny musical instruments that they can play. And that's a fun thing that they love. Give them something that makes some noise and make that wiggle giggle time fun. They love making noise, just banging it on the table or whatever it is. Um, once they hit one to two, you're starting to have a little bit more um, ability to work with them. So they are going to have wiggle giggle, giggle time. Now they're going to start reading the Bible story um, starting at age one. And the way we do it is we want kids to know that the Bible is God's word. 
that everything the Bible says is true and everything they need to know about life they can learn about right here in the Bible. So we always have our teachers hold up an actual Bible, say this is God's word and it's true. By the time they're three or four, they can pretty much say it with us because they've heard it so much. But we hold up this Bible, so they're seeing this is what a Bible looks like. But you know what? This Bible doesn't have pictures in it, so we're going to read our story out of a Bible that does. So a couple good ones that we use, um, there is this series here, the Read Aloud Bible Stories. Um, it's a five volume series and they're just short, simple. This one's actually a little bit longer. It might be like four pages for the story. Or this is a great one. We just started using the Read and Share Bible and it's very short. It's like two pages. So at that age, that's the perfect really amount of time. That's what their attention span is gonna be. So have something bright and fun to look at so that you can tell that story. To them. So now they're reading a Bible story, they're having wiggle giggle, they're going to have a prayer time, and they're going to have that baby praise time from the age of one to two. So our two and three year olds now, they are having the Bible story. Now they're going to start learning a Bible verse that goes along with it. So again, it's going to be something simple. One of our kids' favorite Bible stories is Proverbs 12, 18. Words can cut like a sword or bring healing, we give ourselves a hug. They love that, so we do a little object lesson with a little plastic sword, and of course, you know, kids, they think that's amazing, and talk about band-aids. We put band-aids on when we hurt. Do we want our words to be like a sword, or do we want our words to be like a band-aid? So just put simple motions. It's really easy to come up with something very, very simple that you can have the kids do something while they're saying the verse, because it helps them to remember it. So we start that. Pardon? What verse Proverbs 12, 18. Um, they will have wiggle giggle time, baby praise, prayer, and then now is when they're starting to do the zoo clue. So we'll ring the bell and they run over. And so this, the zoo clue is like summing up the whole day of everything we've learned. The Bible story, the Bible verse, all of those have had to do with if it's God is powerful, it all has to do with that. So God is powerful. So we add that in at age two. So you see each age group is very similar. We just like add another component as they get older. So the kids that have grown up in your early childhood ministry are very familiar with how we do things because we follow the same structure. And for kids, that is a comforting feeling to them. They like to know what's happening and that familiar feeling makes them feel safe. So we just kind of keep it the same so kids know what to expect. So once our kids hit age three, that's when we bring them into our large group um, setting for Zuper Church. And we do that for a couple reasons. One, kids are starting to be able to handle transition a little bit better at that age. For the younger ones, if you can get them in your classroom and get them to stop crying and be happy, we really don't wanna move them to another room and start that all over again. So by age three, they are starting to be able to handle some transition and it kind of helps break up their day a little bit. So even if you don't have a space where you could create like a children's church type setting, if you just have two classrooms, you could even just swap the classrooms where they go to a time where they have a large group like worship service. So our Zuper Church, it's a full kid size worship service. It's going to be fun. It's going to be high energy. Um, we're going to keep things moving really, really fast because their attention spans really short. Um, then we also do it strategically at that age group because we, they're starting to ask questions now at age three. So if you have volunteers in there who are very new in their faith, you may not want them answering kids' questions. So at age three, when they're starting to ask questions, we want to be intentional about who is the one speaking to them um, and teaching them. So we have a higher level leader that is in that Zuper Church spot that will come in and teach the lesson in there. Um, they're also learning how to handle themselves in a group atmosphere a little bit better. They're not attacking their friends or <laughs> whatever. And actually, if you watch little, little kids play, they are very much to themselves. They are happy to just sit and play with their own toys and not even really acknowledge the other kids around them. So at age three, they're kind of starting to realize, oh, it's fun to be with people. And so they really look forward to going to Zuper Church. 
Um, the Zuper Church is going to be filled with um, visual cues. Um, kids can't read the age that we're working with, so you need some kind of object for them to associate with. So when they see this, they can't read the words, God is powerful, but we've talked about it and said it so many times. When they see this picture, they know exactly what this says. So we'll have object lessons, we'll have all these things happening in Zuper Church um, to help connect things with kids for the concepts that we're trying to teach. It's about 20 minutes long. It's, it's gonna be a very short part of their day, um, but you wanna get them in, have that focus time with them, and hopefully they're gonna pick up on what, what you're talking about. So our Zuper Church kind of runs like this. We use the exact same structure every single week so the kids know what to expect. So they're going to come in. We're going to welcome them. We're so excited that you're here. We're going to have so much fun in Zuper Church today. And then we immediately invite them up to come participate and sing a song with us. So we call them up and they come and stand along the front of the stage. And we're going to sing a song that has to do with the Zuku that we're teaching with motions. And so everybody gets to move around and sing the song, which is great because you're getting out some of their wiggles before you're going to ask them to sit still and listen to the Bible story. So we are going to sing that fun song and then we have them go sit down. And what we actually did is we got rid of all of our chairs. We had the little tiny kid sized chairs but it didn't fail however small the chairs were, how much teachers were helping. One by one, they would all start falling out of their chairs. They just couldn't do it. So we got rid of the chairs and we just bought at, we don't have Costco, Costco's the best. We don't have that where we live, we have Sam's. So at Sam's you can get like a puzzle piece mat. They're like squares that look like a puzzle piece and fit them together. So we just created a square for each classroom to sit on. So it's very easy for the kids to be able to be up and down and back and forth without having to get in and out of a chair. So we send them back and their class is going to sit on this square. And then we go over our rules. So we actually have a little toucan puppet that comes out and talks about toucan says all the things you can do when you come to church because we want to focus on the positive, the things we get to do instead of all the things we don't get to do. So we say, you know what? You can be quiet. And then Toucan talks a little bit and you can listen. And we're still saying the rules that we want them to do, but we've done it now in a positive way. The kids love this time. And if we're doing a little bit longer lesson and that's something to cut out, they're like, Toucan's not here. Like they really look forward to that time. And now it's the same rules every single time we have four. You can be quiet, you can listen, you can have fun be because it, or you can praise God and then you can have fun because the most fun that you're ever gonna have is life is worshiping God. And so we do those same four and they know them, they can say them with us. We have our hand motion for each one so they know exactly um, what it is, but we just have that little quick time to remind them of what we need to happen. And then we're call gonna call them back up to do another um, song. So again, that song will have to do with what we're teaching. It's going to have motions. We're moving around, getting the last of the wiggles out, and then we're going to set them back down on their mats for our Bible lesson. So we introduce our Bible story with some kind of an object um, that's going to help them remember that. So if it's, let's see, we talked about um, God, is, God is with me. Can we see God with our eyes? No, we can't. So we had a balloon that had helium in it and another balloon that had no air in it. So they, were, they looked the same, but they acted totally different. This one went up, this one would just fall to the floor. And we can't see God with our eyes, but when he is in us, he's gonna make us act different. So some kind of a visual thing that's, that's connecting your story. And then we actually do our Bible story with a little video clip. Um, we just will find like a two minute video clip. Kids love watching video. It's a great way. And if it's already done well, why and reinvent the wheel? Um, you have so many other things that you can be focusing your time on. So a couple of the series we use that are great, we use little K videos. If you go to kidmo.com, um, you actually will find those. It's, it is actually a full curriculum. You could run like the whole day from this video. It has segments laid out. We just take a two minute snippet for the Bible story um, that we're gonna play. What's it called again? Uh, little K videos from Kidmo, K-I-D-M-O dot com. 
Um, and then we use the Read and Share Bible series. You've probably seen it. It looks just like this. They have great little like two minute snippets also um, that will work with it. So we'll introduce our Bible story and then we're gonna watch that video. And then we have a doodad in the video. So you want something that's gonna keep those kids engaged. If you use the little K series, that's like written in there and they'll tell you exactly what it is. But it's just something we're gonna watch for oh, there's a dog or whatever it is that the kids are going to watch for. So we always talk about that. There's going to be a doodad in our story. And when we see the doodad, we've got to do something. So you're going to instruct them. Like when you see that happen, we're you know all going to put on our looking glasses and look around at our friends and then put our hands back in our lap. Something that goes together. Um, and so then now that's going to be at, towards the end of the video. So now they're engaged in the video, keeping their attention because they all want to do whatever's going to happen when the, when the doodad comes on. So we have our Bible story and then now they've sat for two or three minutes. So we're going to give them another chance to get some wiggles out, do one more song and then sit them down one more time for our Bible verse. And so we do an object lesson. Kids love um, learning through hands-on stuff. So some kind of an object lesson. You can like Google things and find really simple things to do. Um, one of the ones we do is just take a, a paper towel tube and a hair dryer. And if you put a ping pong ball in the tube and put the hair dryer on it, it'll shoot the ping pong ball. And they think it is so hilarious. So we talk about uh, when we pray, our prayers go right up to God and our worship goes right up to God. And so we just use that and it shoots the ball up, do it a few times. Or you can build a rainbow if you're talking about God's faithfulness and the story of Noah um, through like caro syrup and rubbing alcohol with food coloring, different things. Because of the densities of the liquid, you can actually build a rainbow in a cup um, or a jar. So little things like that, something that's fun, that's gonna hold their attention. And so again, we've tied in our Bible story and now we're gonna teach our Bible verse that goes along with that. And it's gonna be a simple Bible verse with our motions and we're gonna repeat that several times. So kind of how we would do it is I'm gonna hold up my Bible. This is God's word. It's my very favorite book. And they know it now basically you just hold up the Bible and they're like, it's God's word and it's true. And so we will read our Bible verse and then we talk about it. And so when we say our verse, this is what I want you to do. When we say words, we're all going to do this like we're talking. Words can cut like a sword. Get your imaginary sword out. Okay, we're going to cut with our sword. Can bring healing. Um, give yourself a hug. So I tell them what the motions are going to be. Okay, now let's all try it together. So then we're gonna repeat it. We're gonna do it really, really loud. How loud can we do it? Oh, that was so good. Now let's see how quiet can we do it. Just change it up a little bit so it holds their attention and you're repeating, 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 repeating and they're getting it. They're getting it a little bit. We've heard that that is their favorite verse. We just do it one time a year, but it's their favorite verse. But I've had moms tell me like, kids fighting in the car and they're carrying on and on and before she can intervene one of the little ones is saying your words are cutting like a sword you want them to bring healing and she's just dealing with it she's only three but she'll deal with it and so they are those little things make it fun they're gonna latch on and they really start to understand and then we're gonna wrap up with a zoo clue so we have like a fire alarm bell sound uh, sound effect that rings and so when that rings, they all run to the mailbox and they're so excited to wrap up our day. The whole day we've been talking about is whatever our Zuku is for that day. And then that's super church. Um, we've laid a lot of foundational truths in that throughout the year. They are starting to get it. We do not do an altar call at the end of every super church because at this age group, one, kids aren't fully understanding what's happened. They're probably only half listening to what you're saying. So when you say, if you would like to ask Jesus in your heart to be your best friend, raise your hand, they probably only heard raise your hand. So they're all gonna raise their hand or they're just gonna do what their friend does. So we just do one or two times a year where we will do an altar call um, and we give them that opportunity that once we do our salvation message, if you wanna ask Jesus to be your best friend forever, 
raise your hand. And then we actually have our team call the kids up one by one because we want to make sure they understand what it is they're doing. And you hear everything from, I just wanted to come up and see the stage. I wanted to come talk to you. <laughs> well, my friend raised his hand. I have no idea why I'm up here. But there are some that get it, and that's the most precious thing is when you've invested into those little ones and you see a three-year-old in their own way be able to express that they understand that God loves them and they want to make that decision. It's absolutely incredible. And it's so sweet the way they say it. You'll know when they understand. They might not be able to put it into the words that you would, but you know when they understand. So we do lead them in a prayer of salvation. And then we give them a sticker because we want to make sure that we are telling mom and dad what happened. Because their parents, they may be new to the church. Their kid with a tender heart may be the one to get it first before mom and dad do. So we want to make sure that we're letting parents know so we can kind of explain that. So they get a sticker. And so that's another thing. They just want to come up and get a sticker Why they might raise their hand. And so for those that do, we just have some little fun animal stickers or something like oh we're so glad you were here today here's a sticker for you but then we have the other stickers that would indicate that that child had asked Jesus into their heart and then we do um, a certificate so the parents can remember that day that we give the parents um, and you have kids that you, we just do it a couple times a year you may have the same kids that do it both times that's okay they have a heart that's hungry for God and, and that's okay. They're probably going to make that decision several times throughout their years, um, but that's okay. And there's going to be those that you never get to see get to that point, but they're so close. And how awesome that we get to pass them on to the elementary team who's probably going to get to see that happen. You play such an important part. So never get discouraged in, oh, it's Sunday, and I don't have enough workers, and we're just going to have to change diapers, and all those things. You, you're seriously, you're changing the world. You are impacting a generation that is going to grow up and change the world. So I'm so excited that you get that opportunity to work with young kids. So thank you for everything that you do. I know the, the parents don't always take time to stop and thank you for what you're doing, but you really are making a big difference in their life. So does anybody have any questions that I could answer that might um, be a situation you're dealing with or anything? When you have a child that starts saying, I want mom, and then they start acting out. Yes. Um, at what point do you actually remove them from the classroom? We, t we let parents know that we're going to work with the child for at least 15 minutes. Um, you, it, that doesn't necessarily mean the whole time we'll be in the classroom because that is super disruptive to the class. It could just take one ch crying child and then it has a ripple effect and the whole class is crying. So we have volunteers that we call coaches that are just extra hands in the hall that might remove the child from the room. And we're going to do bubbles. We're going to try to distract them because sometimes you can just get them distracted, but then you do have the parents that they're not going to be happy with you if you've let their child cry <laughs> all through service. Some parents just, they don't want their kids to cry. They don't tell their kids no, and we're kind of seeing a different style of parenting now. And so we let them know that we'll work with them for 15 minutes, and then we'll text the parents and say, you know, Johnny is really sad. He's doing great. We're happy to work with him, but just so you know. And then depending on what the parent says, if they're being um, like aggressive and hurting kids, then we would remove them and call the parents. Um, just being outright defiant. We try to work with them just the best we can. Um, and sometimes that just takes a buddy. We have like junior workers, if you can put a junior worker with them. Um, sometimes they just need a little bit of love. Usually they're acting out because they're missing something. They're probably not getting love at home. They may not have any structure. And so if we can put somebody with them, you can't always do that. And if you're in a situation where there's no extra hands to help and this child is, there's nothing you can do with them, I would call parents. But 
as much as we can make it work for them, they're gonna get something and parents are gonna get something. And so we want to make it a win for them while they're in our care. Um, and then you also have kids who they are so, so, so smart at this age and they learn it's, it's almost like a reward. They can act naughty and you're gonna call mom and they win, they get mom. Yeah. And so you kinda have to learn that whole thing too and if parents are great with it, then we're gonna try to work them through and not call mom because that's the reward they want and we're almost like reinforcing their bad behavior <laughs> by calling mom. <laughs> We've seen that. Is your ministry always been where it's like bigger like that to work with or do you have any um, ideas for like, because ours is still pretty small and all the kids are in one room. So yeah. it's like the babies Yeah. But like what giving suggestions on like how when you have like a two year old that just wants to run and scream and hit things, how do you like work that in so it's not horribly distracting for the whole group? Yeah. You know, they're not really being bad, they just want right. to play. Like do you have any suggestions on what to kind of do to like love on that kid but at the same time so that they're not so distracting? Like what, what I w the more hands you can have the better. And um sometimes junior workers are a huge um, component that we really could tap into um, because if you can get students love investing like sixth graders are like the perfect age they love wanting to help and be involved and so those younger kids and kids really love them so if you can connect them that you know your responsibility is to be with Johnny today um, have somebody with them if it's like is it one one or two people just in that whole room or do you have extra hands we, uh, there's usually two adults and then there's two junior workers in the room. Yeah. So I would just, as much as that you can have the junior workers kind of helping with those two-year-olds or whatever, and sometimes it's just coming along behind them and you're grabbing their arms and you're doing the motions with them and you've got them and they're where you need them to be, but you're making it fun and kind of help. Eventually they get it. Sometimes it just takes a little bit, but they're gonna catch on and they're gonna realize that it's fun. But those those weeks of getting them to that point can be rough. <laughs> have, have you and your team ever had any ideas or things you wish you could do in your services that you're but you're limited by time? I think you mentioned you guys have hour long services. Mm -hmm. um, Not so much in the early childhood part. Um, simply because their attention spans are so short anyway and we're trying to keep things moving really really fast so we pretty much have sufficient amount of time I know as kids get older you have more ability and that that can become an issue at that point but the way ours is broke down is I we just work with our young ones and so in that age group we have not had that issue just because everything we do is like in like three and five minute snippets any other questions? Well, let's see, is that, we're good on, okay, we've got about five minutes. Yes? Do you have a team of people that writes your curriculum and, and prepares your object lessons and does your craft or how, I mean, obviously you have a bigger, I'm, this is my home church, BCA, and I'm the preschool director. Uh -huh. So I'm in charge of doing all of that right. every week for <clears throat> six services. So how, how would you suggest is a, the most efficient way to get yeah. all those things done when it's pretty much you and you want to make it amazing every week, but that's all. Mm -hmm. It, I would say if you could invest like two years that are you, that you know are going to be really busy and create your structure. So like we have the curriculum and then just rotate it because by the time you're implementing that kids church curriculum they're really going to be in there for two years so if you have that and then you can just rotate it now that's not saying keep it exactly the same every time freshen it up but then you have your base but i i wrote the curriculum we had a team that kind of laid out the concepts and then i did write the curriculum um, but then once you have it you can reuse it so it's like a busy getting there um, and then we repeat i don't know you do do the same thing in all six services yeah, that's what we do. So then at least you're just preparing that one um, message. But we do have a team. Just because we're, we're big, we're dealing with a lot of kids, it does take a lot of hands. And so I actually have a coordinator um, for the different age groups that I kind of give the directive. Like, here's the curriculum. I'm giving it to you. This is what you need to get it ready. And then they prepare it. So, but I if you have any of that extra time to be able to write that curriculum, I would keep reusing it. Right. 
You mentioned how you guys made the effort on those 52 doors to put the zoo glue up. What are some other ways that you guys connect the parents to what's happening in the classrooms during service? Yeah, that's a great question. We. Um, do we we update all of our Zuper Church information and the music on our website? We can't. We just sing along with songs. Um, if you could ever have somebody come in and do live worship with your kids, that's awesome. At one time, we did have a volunteer that would go around with a guitar and sing, and the kids absolutely loved it. But right now, we just sing along with songs, so we can't give them the music. It's copyrighted. But on our website, we'll put what the songs are, and that's a question parents are always asking because their kids know the songs, love the songs, and they want to implement it. So then we're directing them back to the website. Um, we used to print out the information, the zoo clue, the songs, all those things, but parents have so many things and kids and car seats and that they're trying to juggle it was just we were finding them all in the halls so we quit doing that and then it really is a win for your whole church if you can direct people back to your website so that we just put it there now um, then we put it in the zoo clues hanging on the door um, and then our craft that we send home with them would have that information we actually implemented that just recently where they do that craft it's really not a craft, it's a color sheet. Um, we try to keep it really simple because it takes a lot of work to try to cut and do all these things to prepare crafts. So we have a simple craft, it's just a color sheet, and then I'll just create it with whatever our Zuku is or Bible verse on it. And we do that right at the end of the day is when that's on the schedule so that things are calm. When parents come back, they're like, wow, it's instead of, you know, <laughs> typically we were just having like free play time at that time and it's kind of like chaos at that time. Parents are picking up. So since we've implemented that, they're kind of around the table, they're coloring. And so then it leads to a great conversation because that's what their kid's doing when they pick up of commenting on what that um, zoo clue is for how the parents. How do you drive parents to your website? Is that just word of mouth? Do you have a post it? Uh, we'll do a, like an email to them now and then, but they people are just inundated by emails. So most of it is just word of mouth. And the kids, if you keep it exciting, the kids are excited about it and they're asking their parents. And so a lot of parents will come and ask you because they, they want to help their kids understand it or their kids trying to tell them the story and they have no really clue what <laughs> exactly the child's trying to say. So they're asking us. Um, so a lot of the parents come to us and ask, but it, just word of mouth, really. Do you have toys for the preschool age? And then we do. We don't. Um, the way we actually started doing now our playtime is through activity buckets, um, because what we found is even at home, your kids have the toys, but it's like right there and they always see it. It's not really that fun. They don't want to play with it. So they would basically come in, dump all the toys out all over the room, and then nobody would have anything to do. They, it's not fun once it's out. So we, we created activity buckets, which are basically just like theme toys in a plastic like con storage container. And we rotate them through each week so it's something different. So they're so excited to play with it because it's not what they had last week. So it might be puzzles. Um, magna doodle things, just simple things like that. But if you if, if you present it differently, um, it's exciting for them. And we don't, really don't have a lot of free play time because that's when the um, injuries and the biting and all those things happen. So we really don't have a ton of free play time, but we do have toys in the room, toys and books. The chaos towards the end because we have free play at the end. Yes. But it's hard. I want to do a craft or something to color at the end, but I don't have really the time to put all the toys away and out of their sight because if they see them, because I usually direct them to a coloring page, but they still see the toys out and they're like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to play again. Yeah. So I'm trying to. Do they, do you do snack or anything? Yeah. What we do is we direct the teachers like while they're having their snack to clean everything up at that time. Okay. So they're getting everything put away. So snack would be towards the end of the day and then they're going to go into a table time activity okay. that's right there. Okay. Yes. How many children do you have in the room and in these younger ages Um we it just it depends on the volunteers you have that day so our goal would be to keep the for the older preschoolers like 12 to 15 
Um, for the babies, it's going to be smaller than that. Um, but you're going to have, no matter how well your schedule looks going into the service, you're going to wake up with those cancellations. So sometimes our classes, we're not mandated by a certain ratio for their classrooms, um, but we try to keep them, it makes it more pleasant for the volunteers um, to keep it in, at a manageable size. And so 12 to 15 is about what, what is a great number to work with. But that's not always possible, especially if you're combining a lot of age groups into one that can be challenging. With that many kids, I'm just curious about how do you figure out where to put what kid in what class? Is it as they come in, you fill up the class? And then no, finish? it's actually it's assigned by birth date. So our classes, it's like in months. If your birthday is between this month and this month, you're um, automatically assigned. So we just we have to know that. We so kind of have an idea. Consistency that way with the same teacher. Yes, and they can kind of get to know the teachers. So you will, we will end up with some classes that are bigger and some are smaller, um, but they are, they're all pre-assigned through the check-in system. It automatically will give them based on their birth date cool. an assignment. All right. Any more questions before we go? We got to wrap it up. So who do you use? What, what do you use for your check-in? <laughs> um, we have been using Fellowship One is a check-in system and we're actually just getting ready to transition into uh, Seraphim. So I don't know if you've heard through that. It's a, it's a computerized check-in. The difference that we love about that, there's my alarm saying I need to stop talking, um, is it operates, a Fellowship One is a Wi-Fi system, so you have to have good Wi-Fi. And if you have a lot of people checking in, it gets really slow and then you have people taking notes and service using Wi-Fi and who knows what else, checking Facebook. Um, so a lot of Wi-Fi is happening and so the check-in system was going really slow. So Seraphim works, um, it's grounded, so it's not using Wi-Fi. Everything will still download. You'll use Wi-Fi later to connect it, but that's a great win if you're trying to check in a lot of kids or don't have good internet. How do you spell that? Uh, S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. All right. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for making a difference in this world. You really are. Thank it was you. great hanging out with you.